So, um, it is my privilege and great pleasure uh, to uh, wish you welcome to this uh, seminar uh, about uh, Sudan and South Sudan and the uh, border and borderlands uh, between these two countries. Uh, it is, um, uh, yeah, there, there is a lot to be said here, but I could perhaps first draw your attention to the report that is uh, the basis of uh, the presentation and discussion we're going to have today. Uh, that is uh, a result of a collaboration uh, between uh, PRIO and the uh, University of Juba, uh, more specifically between myself and uh, Alfred Lokudji over here. Um, and uh, it is uh, again a result of uh, the very kind and generous support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, peace and Reconciliation section that has provided the funding uh, for this uh, research project, um, which uh, will also encompass a study of uh, new challenges to South Sudan's sovereignty that will hopefully be presented at a later stage. Um, and then uh, I would uh, uh, like to... Uh, my name is uh, Oystein Rolandsen, uh, for instance, uh, <laughs> just to mention that. Uh, and uh, so I'm a senior researcher here at PRIO. I've been working with Sudan for a long time. Uh, but uh, I also want to present uh, the uh, panel here. Uh, as I said, Alfred uh, Lukudji is from uh, Juba University. He's, uh, long, long, uh, he's, he's the dean of the College of uh, Rural Development. He has a uh, long uh, experience from working uh, with uh, issues uh, having to do with both natural resource management with conflict uh, uh, resolution with the post-conflict situation in uh, South Sudan. Uh, so we will do the presentation together. Uh, then we have two discussants. Uh, it's uh, Dr. Guma Kome from uh, uh, originally from Juba University but now uh, uh, at uh, uh, being a senior researcher in uh, Germany in um, uh, and uh, uh, probably you can say something more about uh, yourself when we come that far. But he has, he's uh, perhaps one of, the, or I think one of the world leading experts on uh, the issues of uh, Nuba Mountain, Southern Kordofan, uh, local uh, questions uh, to have with land, with conflict. But he also has a broad knowledge, of course, of Sudan and the region, uh, Horn of Africa region as such. And uh, Gunnar Sörbe from the Christian Mikkelsen Institute. Uh, it uh, should be a very no well-known character in uh, the uh, Norwegian Sudan uh, setting. He, uh, he's uh, been uh, been the director of uh, CMI pre previously. He's a social anthropologist. He has a long experience from uh, research, uh, especially in uh, northern Sudan, but uh, he's not uh, completely unfamiliar to South Sudan either. So. Uh, what we will do today is to give a short presentation of the report and then uh, the discussants will uh, have the opportunity to uh, comment on the report and then we will open up the floor for uh, discussion. So I think without much more ado that we will just uh, start uh, the presentation. I mean if there is a need for some kind of uh, clarification uh, feel free to ask uh, uh, ask for that, but uh, for the more kind of lengthy questions, comments, uh, it's better to wait uh, until afterwards. Okay, so then I will jump straight into it. So, uh, as I think should be apparent to most of you uh, by now, this uh, presentation is about the consequences. So, uh, introducing an international border between uh, Sudan and South Sudan. Um, we, uh, many of you are familiar with the fact that there has been an escalating uh, uh, insecurity uh, and also a low-scale conflict uh, going on, especially in Blue Nile and in uh, southern Kordofan. And for the benefit of those of you that don't know the Sudan map by heart, I also uh, included a small map uh, here, which I think we can also have a small pointer. So um, the border uh, we are talking about is uh, going uh, more or less uh, like this. Of course, there are some debates going on on which, which of these areas belongs to which government. Still, that hasn't been clarified in the negotiations. But this is 
the border we're talking about. And we know that in this area and also over here that there are uh, considerable violence going on. There has also been uh, considerable uh, destabilization going on in the northern part of uh, Unity State. So these are some of the current affairs. Uh, but in this presentation, uh, the plan was actually to uh, uh, talk about the more kind of long-term uh, issues. So because the point we're trying to get across here is that although it's very easy to follow the media's attention and uh, immediate policy uh, groups' uh, need for uh, try, uh, for looking at you know the most recent refugee crisis, the most uh, the latest uh, bombing. Uh, so when it's also necessary to look at the more long-term issues uh, involved here. Uh, and uh, uh, as we see it, uh, there is uh, uh, first uh, the question of. Uh, uh, the negotiated solution uh, for the border, uh, that is, and these uh, uh, negotiations is taking place now in uh, Ethiopia, uh, in Addis Ababa, between the government of Sudan and uh, the government of South Sudan. Uh, and then also how these borders are going to be managed uh, after, uh, after the, uh, an agreement has been reached. Uh, and that there also needs to be some thinking about uh, how does uh, the prospects of a future border management regime actually impact uh, the ongoing negotiations. Um, and then the other point we would like to em emphasize is that of a disparity of interest between the national uh, level and that of the people living in the borderlands when it comes to both, the, uh, especially when it comes to the way that these borders are going to be managed. So that's, uh, so we want to present some of the findings we found there uh, try to uh, nuance this a little bit uh, and then uh, to uh, bring up some questions for uh, debate. And now let's see if... Okay, so as you already have seen, uh, the current uh, uh, context uh, of this uh, issue is that it's, it is very important to make this very clear distinction uh, between uh, because it's very easy to mix, especially when you read the literature on uh, border negotiation, on uh, border management, there is a, very, uh, is a tendency to mix together uh, this issue of the hard versus the soft border. Uh, I, um, I should perhaps uh, take a brief, uh, brief break to just explain hard, soft border. When we're talking about uh, hard and soft border, it's first and foremost in the way that the border is managed. Uh, what kind of regime the, uh, the governments that uh, are having these borders are putting in place. Uh, and uh, a, uh, a hard border management regime means that there is a very tight control of, of the movement uh, uh, across uh, the border, both of uh, goods and of people. Uh, in many ways, you can say that the, uh, the border management of the EU zone uh, versus the rest uh, of the world is, is somewhat a hard border. Uh, while a soft border is uh, then the opportunity wh where it's a much uh, freer uh, opportunity to move across uh, the border. Uh, sometimes this can be involuntarily because the government doesn't have the capacity to police uh, the border areas. And this was something when we presented this report in Juba that we discussed a lot, uh, what is the possible opportu real opportunity for the government of Sudan and the government of South Sudan to actually establish the hard border management regime in, uh, uh, in the border between these two countries. Uh, and we can also get back to this in the discussion. So, but this is uh, the question of the hard and soft border is basically what is happening after a negotiated solution has uh, been uh, agreed upon. Uh, and uh, these two issues ha have very kind of different uh, connotations because there are a number of areas along the north-south border that are contested at the moment that the parties don't agree who owns uh, the area. Uh, Abiea is, uh, of course, the, uh, the most uh, prominent one, the, the one that's been discussed the most, but also uh, along in Unity State, as I was uh, pointing out, uh, uh, and uh, in the uh, immediate area to the north, the Hejlidj area up to Keresana, is also another contested area, together with the Kafia Kingi uh, area to the west uh, on the border to uh, 
uh, on the border to Congo. Uh, and all these, uh, so this needs to be solved before a uh, border can uh, border management regime, whether it's going to be a soft or a hard, and also the border to be demarcated, actually to be physically decide where is this border going to be fixed on the ground. These, uh, before this is going to happen, there, there needs to be an agreement between the government of Sudan and the government of South Sudan on, uh, ma uh, on a number of these uh, contested areas. Um, so that's, uh, that was uh, kind of the important distinction here between these two. Um, and then it's also important to be aware of the historical process here. Uh, because uh, during, uh, as uh, was, uh, we also discovered when we did our fieldwork now in uh, March, April last year, is that this border between North and, or, or what was between North and South Sudan uh, before the separation was already managed as a quasi-international border in many ways, where movement were controlled, uh, where there was uh, attempts at uh, uh, levying taxes uh, on people going uh, back and forth across the border. Uh, so that means that the introduction of this uh, border between, North, uh, between the South Sudan and Sudan is not as abrupt or sudden as uh, one people, people might uh, expect, but it is a kind of, it had already started uh, during this uh, CPI period. Uh, and then there are these uh, current issues that are very difficult, that uh, makes it, uh, that kind of uh, decides the way the border is functioning at the moment. And that is, uh, of course, uh, this uh, massive mobilization of government troops on both sides of the border, especially in uh, the oil areas, but also other places, uh, which creates tension and which also uh, means that, uh, that even the presence of uh, you know, large military forces has a tendency to disrupt uh, life and also uh, there is a need f uh, for military purposes to police uh, parts of this border um, further. Uh, and then of course has uh, also been, uh, uh, there is this counter accusations of uh, proxy warfare uh, where uh, the government of South Sudan is uh, accusing uh, the government of Sudan of supporting uh, various uh, rebel or destabilizing elements or small militia groups in uh, South Sudan and uh, vice versa that uh, there are allegations that the government of South Sudan is uh, supporting the groups uh, that are fighting in uh, uh, southern Kordofan and in the Blue Nile which uh, uh, and uh, it's uh, of course I haven't been to this area so or I, I went to the unity state but I didn't talk to any of this so I cannot verify uh, any of these allegations, but uh, it seems to be uh, possible that there are something into it. Um, and also another consequence of this uh, is uh, the blockade uh, that was uh, especially came into place around uh, uh, last summer uh, of goods uh, coming from uh, the north. Um, might not be uh, no, uh, widely known that these areas of South Sudan that is uh, bordering North Sudan is to a high degree dependent on goods uh, being transported from uh, North Sudan and sold by North Sudanese merchants uh, of various uh, kinds and also some uh, southerners. And this blockade is a very serious um, uh, problem for the people living there. Uh, it's, it, there have, has been attempts to try to move uh, goods from the south, but uh, especially for Unity State and especially during the rainy season, it's, uh, it's difficult for <laughs> all different uh, places to get to a Unity State during the rainy season, but uh, there is at least, uh, the situation has been better previously. Um, and then finally, this uh, ongoing, uh, very difficult discussion on the access uh, of uh, relief to uh, uh, southern Kordofan and to uh, Blue Nile. That uh, is, of, firstly, uh, to, to a far extent, a conflict zone, but it's also a problem with government policy on, uh, the, uh, um, on the northern side uh, for various reasons. Uh, we have representatives here from uh, the Sudan uh, embassy, so they might also comment upon this at a later stage, but uh, at the moment, uh, the access to these areas for uh, international humanitarian organizations is very limited. Uh, and, uh, of course, since this border has been introduced between North and South, the opportunities for bringing in relief from the South is also uh, highly problematic. Uh, so that is the current situation. 
Uh, and then uh, uh, Alfred is going to say a little bit uh, about uh, the situation when it comes to the various ways that people are interacting across uh, the border. Well, I will be operating the mm. uh, uh, PowerPoint to my best of abilities, which is not yeah. so good, actually. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Ostein. I'm going to limit myself uh, to the interaction between local communities at what has practically become an international border and the interaction that's basically between citizens of the two nations, uh, especially business people who need mobility between the northern Sudan and the, and the southern Sudan. I want to make a point, and this point tends to cloud people's understanding of what is going on. The concept of borders. Uh, even before you start talking about soft border and hard border, generally, all the communities of Sudan have some understanding of what their home territories are. The fact that they cannot point a hard line to you on the ground or produce a Google map that shows where the line runs, does not deny the fact that there is an understanding of a border. Uh, if you take the Nuba Mountains, or even my community, the Nuba occupy specific territory in Sudan. And among the Nuba themselves, they can distinguish between villages. They'll tell you if you cross over to that mountain, you are in such a village although they may not be able to tell you where the line actually runs. I, I think that's a very important uh, thing to understand. Uh, otherwise, uh, there is a lot of jumbling when people start talking about, do you have title deeds? Do you have that and that? And, and, and they miss the point. Now, the local interaction. We were told, and it's, it's almost common sense, whether you are on an international border or internal borders between communities, there is a dynamic of interaction for various purposes. Marriage, grazing, visiting, uh, trading. And so that movement uh, has gone on for generations uninterrupted. What is happening since the internalization of the, the, internationalization of the border between Sudan and South Sudan is that the capitals have begun to play a role and have a say on what happens. Now, the people at the local uh, area told us that in the past, they could interact. They even knew the chiefs in the various areas across. And that were it left up to them, they probably could work out solutions to the problems they have in terms of entitlements, in terms of rights to move to movement. If the border becomes international, then the management of that border is overtaken by the government. In which case, you know, they might start saying passports and IDs and, and what have you. And of course, the, 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 the driver behind all that sometimes is, is local, local officials, is the fees. You know, there are fees for crossing. You know, you need to buy this and that. Uh, even at Juba, if you were there, you know, you need to have your, your passport photocopied and, and, you know, and all of that. Somebody is, is buying cows on doing the photocopies, you see. <laughs> <laughs> so there are, there are benefits there. So that local dynamic has, uh, uh, has, an, uh, has been internationalized by having the two, the two countries uh, uh, having their, uh, their immigration regimes wanting uh, to take over. Now, so far, it has only succeeded at certain points, hard points. But in general, uh, control of borders is not yet, it's not as easy as uh, uh, we might want to believe. Then the, the, the long distance dynamic, which means the border being used not necessarily just by local people, but by those who might be coming from far down south of the border or far up the border. A very good example are the traders. There are traders, northern Sudanese, who buy from the manufacturers in Khartoum or elsewhere, sodas, salt, uh, food items, clothing, uh, generally uh, 
you know, trade it from China or from Dubai, but they get to Khartoum and then they have to find their ways to, 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 to the markets in South Sudan. The map that uh, Oystein showed you before, uh, if, had it been more, more detailed to show you, for instance, distances from uh, Lake State to the border with Sudan, or from uh, Lair, which is more or less in the middle of uh, Unity State, to the border with Uganda. You know, if you were a businessman, you would not calculate where to go on the basis of your political affiliation. You would go on the basis of the cost of transporting your goods and the profit that you, you, you may make from, uh, from, from the enterprise. So the people in at the border area and those far from the border have suffered in the sense that now the, if the border comes under a hard border regime with all sorts of requirements, uh, including uh, vaccination certificates for yellow fever and, and, and what have you, movement becomes very hard. And the consequence is that the consumers of the products from Khartoum suffer because what they have become used to are not in the market. As well, the producers and the middlemen who benefit from trading in these items suffer in that it is, it's no longer, instead of making maybe two trips, too much of headache, maybe they reduce it to one trip or to three. Uh, we've had the cases of people whose trucks with goods were stopped. This, in a gist, represents the problems that have to be dealt with between the South Sudan and the North Sudan, not from a capital perspective. And the capital perspective is simply we want borders, hard regime borders. But the dynamic for, for trade and for the local people is more we want a regime that promotes, that are user-friendly rather than hard. And this, these are issues that are yet to be um, appreciated both in Juba and in Khartoum. Finally, uh, I want to end by making a, a, a point. And it is that we should never underestimate the power of local people to undermine the strategies and intentions of the capital. When the blockade took place, there is uh, some question as to the degree of Khartoum's involvement in that blockade. It seems segments of people who occupied parts of southern Kordofan decided they were going to, to blockade uh, the road and obstruct traffic for whatever reason. The youth, I'm talking about young people, on a voluntary basis, not, in, not, not commanded by anybody, threatened that they would go and free those trucks and disrupt the oil operations in southern Sudan in Unity State if those, the, there are people who are stranded on buses and the goods that were on these, on these trucks were not allowed to, to move freely. The governor pleaded profusely with them to please give the government a chance to handle this, uh, this blockade and allow these goods to be free, uh, at least they refrain from invading the, the, the territory where this blockade took place. I want to show you that this was not a threat, a verbal threat that could not be backed up. In the recent clashes between the Murle and the, and the Lone Ware, the vice president, Riak, went and met the youth the so-called the remnants of the white army, pleaded with them to leave, give government a chance to work out a peaceful solution to the Murle law uh, dispute. In spite of that, when the vice president left, the youth of the law attacked Pibor, occupied it for some time, 
and to me, that, that's a very clear uh, example of what the local people, when they are sufficiently annoyed, can do regardless of what their capital, their, the authorities of the capital do or say. And these are lessons to be learned both by the Juba as a capital and Khartoum as a capital. I think I'll, I'll leave it at that and um, uh, you know, give you opportunities to ask questions or make comments later. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. OK. We, we made it in a way that we are now returning back to some uh, summary points uh, from uh, uh, my side uh, before we open up for uh, discussion, discussions. Uh, now, as uh, Alfred has been talking about uh, the uh, kind of the perspectives from the local side, uh, both this kind of short uh, migration issues, the issues about trade with Khartoum, and also the movement of people, since there is this substantial amount of uh, southerners living in North Sudan, 600,000, I think, is the latest assessment, uh, that also has this need to move uh, between the borders of uh, uh, North and South Sudan. So these are kind of many of the concerns, and especially people of the borderlands that have migrated to the north. Uh, but then, uh, what I'm trying to show you now is how, um, how all of these different concerns of the national government are working towards a hard border ma management regime and against the interest of a soft border. Uh, the, for instance, the concern of the government would be uh, to be able to deter an uh, invasion of their territory, which uh, uh, it's, uh, it seems like it is unlikely that uh, a large-scale war will start between South, and, uh, South Sudan and Sudan at the moment. But still, there is a very clear tension between these governments. And uh, it is also a kind of a general concern for most governments to be able to repel any kind of external threats. Uh, and then it's, of course, the need to uh, control migration in uh, v different ways, depending on their situation. Their needs uh, varies. But, uh, uh, this is uh, also has been raised as a concern both from uh, the government of South Sudan and the government of Sudan in particular, I would say. Uh, and then the needs uh, to control imports and exports, both in terms of uh, deterring unwanted uh, goods uh, to entering the country, but also to uh, benefit economically in terms of lev uh, levying custom fees and uh, things like that. Uh, and. Uh, of course, uh, some people have also strong constituencies in the borderlands, and there, there is a need for a central government to protect uh, their uh, people in the borderland. Uh, ideally, uh, a government should be interested in protecting the, everyone inside their borders. But um, in the politics or the real politics, you see that uh, the, uh, people are treated differently. Uh, so, but that is also another concern. Uh, and in all these cases, to, be, to have a control of what is going on on the border is uh, a way to avoid this. Uh, uh, and finally, uh, also, uh, to, uh, if the border is efficiently controlled, then it can also be used as a buffer to protect what might be seen as more central areas uh, of the country. Uh, so that uh, uh, as long as uh, any kind of external forces are kept on the other side of the border, then they have a further way to go in order to reach uh, uh, the, often the main areas of the country. And finally, um, that uh, in order to use uh, borderlands as ef effective ways for skirmishes and uh, especially for proxy warfare, the, there is a need for, to have rare bases on the other side. And if the border is managed uh, in a very soft way, then kind of this purpose is uh, somewhat uh, defied. So, so the main point here is that in all, this, all these things that government wants with borders, they want to have it st strictly controlled for all these reasons. So, and this needs to be given uh, due thought when uh, policies are developed and also when the international community interact uh, with uh, the governments that are negotiating over borders and border regimes. Um, and then just to briefly conclude, uh, as I was saying in the introduction, I think it's very important to look beyond the current crisis and look at some of these more fundamental issues when it comes to the disparity of the interest of the people in the borderlands and of the national capitals. Uh, and uh, uh, then uh, especially to uh, discuss this issue of the future border management regime. Um, because uh, one thing is that uh, 
unless they have uh, these border people in the borderlands have a very strong constituency and a strong representation in the government, they have a tendency to not being represented, and that their uh, views and perspectives uh, are not necessarily taken into account or brought to the negotiation table. Uh, and here, of course, uh, 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 facilitators uh, from uh, that is not uh, you know among the parties might also play a role in pressuring. Uh, the government delegations to include people from uh, these areas, especially in the negotiations over the borders. Um, and uh, it's also important to, to be aware that uh, the, what kind of border management regime will uh, be introduced in the future might also uh, influence the negotiations over the border areas. Because if there is a hard border, it will be seen as a zero-sum game where uh, those that win uh, certain territories will be have exclusive access, exclusive right to use this. But if there is a, border, a soft border management regime, then there is a possibility to share resources, to move freely across, and it's not necessarily seen as a win-lose situation for the people living uh, in the area, which then also <laughs> might make it easier to find a compromise on all of these contested areas. If uh, um, but there are, of course, other issues uh, lurking at behind, specifically the question of oil, which is, uh, will probably continue to be a zero-sum game, that some, one government has the <laughs> right to, to exploit oil and the other one doesn't. So that's uh, also some of the things that needs to be balanced. And uh, on a kind of final point of conclusion, I think uh, this is uh, not something that will be solved with one agreement or with one uh, specific uh, uh, decision, uh, but it will be an ongoing process. It, uh, this is a new situation that uh, people, both in the uh, different governments and also in the borderlands, needs to adapt to. Uh, and as uh, Alfred also was pointing out, that uh, the people in this uh, borderlands have a very high degree of agency, a very high degree of opportunity to uh, I would almost say do whatever they like uh, for the time being, despite this very strong militarization and strong government presence in the area. So that, uh, I think, was uh, the, what we were mainly trying to say here now. So uh, maybe Goma would like to start? My name is uh, Juma Kunda. Call me. Yes. As if you uh, want to use a pointer, it's the yellow button. OK. Uh, thank you. Um, I, um, I was the uh, assistant professor at Juba University until the day of the separation. And uh, after that, I was uh, uh, assistant professor at Bahri University in Khartou, a new university which was established to accommodate the Muslim staff from the three, oh, yes. uh, from the three universities. Yes, yes. Sorry. This one? Mm -hmm. And... Um, so the, uh, but uh, from uh, last uh, December, I have been actually uh, taken a position as senior research fellow at the Max Planck Institute uh, in Germany. Um, my academic career has been intensively and excessively on Nuba Mountain. And um, my contribution in this uh, intervention will be actually looking at the report from the northern side of the border areas. Um, and I would like just to start by uh, commenting on this uh, very uh, important and timely report for policymakers. Actually, this is, I think, the this is one of the one of the issue which is going to uh, take the two country for some time, for some years to come. And I think uh, such a report in this time is extremely important as a contribution of uh, enriching the incitement of the decision makers and, and, and politicians uh, at both uh, sides. I think this is a very uh, a good report and uh, it can be uh, used to build on a lot of uh, issues which are now touched here uh, in a very minor way, but they can be actually uh, carried further. I will start by saying that uh, the separation of, uh, of South Sudan uh, as it was mentioned, the report has uh, one of the implications was necessarily that the internationalization of a mere administrative 
local border into international boundary. And uh, I am not going to uh, consider the whole boundary, but I would rather uh, consider on the boundary, 65% of the boundary, which is actually the boundary that constitute the southern part of South Kordofan boundary itself. And the, before going to that specific part, I would like to say that um, if you take Sudan as uh, one country uh, for the sake of debate, you will find that the borderlands area now, the borderland area meaning the areas south, the southern in the in, for the northern part of South Sudan, and the southern part of the northern Sudan, and if you imagine there is a border, then you take some part in the northern part. In the, these are the borderland areas. If you carefully look at this zone, um, and I'm a geographer by profession, this area actually represents sixty percent, if not more, of the Sudan economic belt. It is the area which represents like 80% of the mechanized farming for both. Whether you are taking Sudan, uh, Su Northern Sudan or Southern Sudan. For Southern Sudan, actually it represents 100% of the mechanized farming. And it represents 100% of the non-oil belt. It represents almost more than 80% of the mineral, exploited minerals, especially gold, in the Blue Nile. It represents like 70% of the grazing land, and something like 40% of gum Arabic. And these are actually the items that are dominate the Sudanese economy. More than that, it actually represents more than 60% of the total Sudanese population. So you are talking about the boundary in a very intensive, dynamic area, and you want to draw a border. So I think when we look at these issues, you have to carry this general general uh, 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 thinking in your mind. Now, I will just sh confine my comments in an area. Uh, Thank you. Um, now, if you follow um, the, uh, the border, So uh, if you see the uh, South Kordofan, uh, which starts from here, from here, Magenis Jebel here, between White Nile and, and South Kordofan and, 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 and uh, Upper Nile, and then you go along the way up to this point, uh, Northern Bahar al-Ghazal, uh, Southern Darfur, South Kordofan. If you measure this in terms of length, it represents like 65% of the total 2,000 kilometers of, of the two Sudan borders. So, and I'm, 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 I'm making this reference because I want now to move into what does it mean to South Kordofan? Uh, this international, internationalization of, the, of this local administrative border have actually Good. Try this one. Good. Yes. Um, the one of the implication is that most of the borderlands, especially the Nuba Mountain and Blue Nile, because uh, these are the area and ABA, because these are the area which are contested and they are actually at the center of the source now uh, source uh, north relation at the present time. Uh, 
their, their, their internationalization has a tremendous geopolitical significance to the, to the, to the two-state relationship. Now, I just want to mention like three points. Um, the South Kurdufan or Nuba Mountain region, it's, uh, it is also, <laughs> apart from being shifted from a central state, because before the, before the independence of the South, Nuba Mountain will always be quoted as, it is located in the central part of the Sudan. Now, there is a, a significant relative repositioning. So now it is a borderland state. And that has a tremendous geopolitical significance. So uh, the, this shift has, in addition to this, South Kurdufan also is also a basket which is hosting almost all the unfinished agenda of between the north and the south. It is a basket where ABA is put in. It is a basket where the oil is in. It is a basket where SPLA forces, almost like, um, let me say, 95% uh, of, the, of the fighting forces of the SPLA north are actually based in this territory. Uh, it is a base of the contested nomadic range land. And there is like five contested border areas, Kafe Kanji, uh, ABA, Kaka, Meganis, and uh, some area in the Blue Nile there. L there are like eight points. Five of them are in South Kurdufan. So that gives South Kurdufan a, a, actually a serious political significance between the two, the two states. Now what's happening now there is that the conflict which arise in South Kurdufan remind me again the, 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 the second civil war that South Kurdufan was also the bridge of the extension of the war from the south to the north. The extension of the war from the south to the north was via Nuba Mountain. And again now, the war started in the Nuba Mountain and now is extended into the Blue Nile. They are bringing in the, uh, there are four rebels and now the center of the of, of, the, of what they call Sudan Liberation, Revolution, Liberation Front, Revolution. Revolution Front. If you would like to have it uh, militarily, the focus is actually Nuba Mountain because the base is Kauda. Now, what does it mean for borderlanders? What does it mean for the local people? Fair enough. Mm -hmm. uh, what does it mean? It means that, first of all, after the, after the war, and as it was mentioned, and the blockage of the Sudan government from allowing the humanitarian relief to enter into the Nuba Mountain, the area which are controlled by the uh, SPLA North, the local people have actually looked southward. To the border, not as, not as, not, not as a barrier, no, but as a connector. And that's, that's a very important point. So they are now looking southward to the border as a resource. Which means that instead of having loyalty toward the central government, they are establishing new loyalty beyond the border. And this is also having implication on the local dynamics related to the border usage. Um, definitely, the presence of the military operation there between the SPLA and the government along the border, the border itself became also uh, a, a, battle, a battleground, uh, mostly in the, in, the, in the Nuba Mountain. I would like just to say that in this uh, remaining one minute, that today there is 
Unimus with the additional S, مش كده? In the southern part of the border, without having a present in the northern in the northern part of the and the border, and that actually has implica implication when the international community would like to have some witness from the representative on the ground because they will represent one side of the image. Mm. And I think this is one of the one of the issue which is really very strange uh, to, to, to have it like that. Uh, the second point is that I believe that the cent the this I believe in the centrality of the contested area, the Nuba Mountain, Abye and the and the Blue Nile, I believe that they are at the center of resolving the unfinished agenda between North and South. Mm. And I don't believe that the border will be managed or will be demarcated at all before you handle these issues properly. And once you handle them, the border issue will be an automatic process. Because the local community themselves will be facilitated to this process. At the moment, they are not facilitated. Because they are not involved, and they are not also, as the report point out, they are not part of the process itself. So where you are going to draw the boundary, if I'm not quite sure whether this boundary is actually serving me or not, I will actually contribute to make the confusion, uh, the situation uh, continue in a very confusing way, because in that confusion, you are actually surviving. And I will just uh, leave it at there. Thank you very much. <laughs> then I think uh, we give the word to Gunnar. Do you prefer to sit or do you want to uh, I think, lecture? I think I, can, uh, I think I can just sit here and uh, if I speak loudly enough, I don't. Quickly move the microphone over to your side. Yeah. Do you hear me well? Um, I will try to be brief because so much uh, territory has already been uh, covered uh, li in, in, in a double sense of the word, territory. Uh, <clears throat> let me start by saying that um, to the title, Drifting Apart, question mark, um, like it or not, the answer is no. Uh, for very simple reason that these are two countries which share a destiny. Um, and they are going to share this destiny for a very long time to come. So uh, 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 drifting apart is not an option. You may want it, but it is not an option. Uh, going in that direction would just lead to uh, prolonged warfare um, and, 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 uh, and a lasting conflict uh, beyond what we have uh, already. Um, we have heard why this is such a big deal. I mean, there are many countries which uh, have a, a population straddling the bo boundaries and, uh, and uh, moving, moving back and forth. Uh, Ethiopia is, of course, uh, a near neighbor. Uh, South Sudan and Kenya, another example. It's not a big deal. I mean, people are crossing all the time. Um, but if you just compare, let's say, Ethiopia with, uh, with these uh, two uh, new countries, South Sudan and Sudan, you will see that, uh, first of all, as, as Juma said, we are talking about very large populations. Uh, we are talking about very important resources. While in, in the Ethiopian case, you are talking about politically marginalized populations, like the Anwak and the Nuer and so on, uh, which do not, in Addis Ababa, have a major political position. In, uh, in the Sudan, if you take the northern side, uh, you have the Bagara groups like the Meseria, which we hear about in this report, but if, if you move to southern Darfur, you have the Risaigat, the largest Arabic group in, uh, in Darfur. And these are not politically marginal populations. These are potentially powerful populations. They, they feel marginalized. And um, they may change sides and so on. Some of them may join SPLA, which they have done. Uh, but, but in a sense, they are potentially politically powerful. And of course, on the southern side, you have like the Dinka and the Nuer. 
uh, do dominating much of the political scene in, in, in Juba and elsewhere in the south. So the, these are big issues. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Without uh, addressing, uh, confronting these problems, um, we are living, we are going to, to have a perpetual turbulence, which some say has already become perpetual, but definitely we will perpetuate it even more. Uh, what is complicating, of course, is that there are so many issues on the agenda that still has to be resolved in addition to the topic that is specifically dealt with in this paper. The two parties have to strike, or the two countries have to strike a new arrangement on oil. Uh, they have to agree on RBA somehow. There are international treaties and legal issues, maybe not very complicated still. It's not all solved. There is the external debt burden. Uh, there are the Nile waters, uh, which is not being touched at the moment because it's uh, left there mm -hmm. for the future. Uh, but this is, a, is, is, is an issue of, of great international importance where so far Egypt and Sudan, Sudan may be a little bit uneasy uh, in its relationship with Egypt. You know, the, the, the whole, the, whole uh, the, the, the conflict uh, that uh, stems from the fact that many of the other countries want to use more of the, of the waters of the Nile and then you have suddenly a new state on the Nile. Um, and then there is the issue of citizenship, which is being sort of indirectly dealt with here. Uh, because it relates to cross-border migration as well, but it also relates to people living, uh, residing, for example, in Khartoum or in Omdurman or in Kassel and elsewhere, and land use and trade. And then, as Juma said and, uh, and the others, as part of this, to agree on the border or the boundary, where uh, I thought there were still s six sectors only still contested, but uh, as Juma says, there are even, even more. I think the uh, I think there are three or four problems, uh, and I don't personally have, have have answers to these, of course. But I think it's important to to point to them, and it's being done in this excellent report. One one challenge is that local populations have their own interests, and they have their own conflicts as well, going back for a long time, in some cases, and local violence in different hotspots may not only flare up, but they are also in the Sudanese context increasingly interconnected with the large-scale uh, developments and large-scale conflicts. ABA is just one example. It has become a metaphor for the Sudanese problem more generally, uh, but it's, it's, it's a case in point where you see something which in many ways can be looked upon as a local conflict, but it is becoming related to very big issues. And Sudan is one of these places in the world where local developments and local violence may have great influence on macro political and even international developments, I would say. It's not uh, all countries which, where this is likely to happen, but I think Sudan is definitely a case where, where this is, there is a risk of this to happen. Another big challenge is that these issues which have been mentioned here are, are interconnected. Uh, the, uh, it is difficult to see how, for example, the issue of citizenship can be resolved in isolation from the ABA. Uh, because how can you expect South Sudan to make what they would consider as compromises on ABA if Southerners are deprived of their rights in the north. Um, and there is a lot of unease, of course, about this. Uh, for example, the staff of the University of Khartoum um, have uh, come under the Civil Service Act. Uh, some, a lot of them would dispute this because the University of Khartoum is under its separate act, actually, in the legal sense. But the southerners who were teaching at the University of Khartoum uh, received um, after July, uh, a letter where they were told that they had no longer jobs at the University of Khartoum uh, because it ca came under the Civil Service Act and you have to be a Sudanese citizen to then serve as a professor or lecturer at the University. 
So already there are complications around uh, a lot of unease, but it's uh, it's still an unresolved issue. But but of course, it uh, it is interconnected with other issues like ABA, like like many others. So we need some kind of package deal. A third uh, complicating issue that I know Alfred has been uh, preoccupied with in other contexts is that. Um, um, deals have to be struck both on the local and the national levels. But on the local levels, much have changed during the war. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that have changed, for example, in the South, is that war led to breakdown of traditional forms of authority. And there have been new forms of authority or, or traditional leaders have been challenged by military leaders mm -hmm. who uh, tell the people that they represent them, uh, that they represent, the, I represent my tribe. <laughs> Uh, do they have any authority to rep represent their tribe? Uh, I'm not sure about that, and I think people are not sure about that. But the point is that there is a breakdown on these authority systems, and of course on the northern side, there have also been a number of changes uh, starting uh, in the early 70s, when the native administration was, uh, was uh, for practical purposes, uh, abolished. And you have, you have competing uh, systems of authority, and that makes it a complicating factor in what has to be done on the local levels, as Juma uh, ended his talk. If, the, if some of these issues can be resolved on the b national levels, uh, it follows automatically <laughs> on the local levels because local population are used to handle local resource issues. I remember coming to Sudan as a student. That is a very long time ago, as you see. And um, there were annual peace conference, conferences conferences in this belt. Exactly. Among the Dinka and the Bagara, every year there was a peace conference mm -hmm. after perhaps one person unfortunately was killed. Uh, it, the, the, the scale of, of killing now is different because of the arms. They used to have only spears. Um, and they solved it, they resolved it. And there are still some cases in the Sudan where this is being dealt with in local levels, but unfortunately, uh, it's not only complicated by what has happened in, on local levels, but it's also actually undermined by these larger political forces uh, surrounding this, uh, and which makes it more and more difficult to make local solutions. So the Miseria are seeing themselves, whether they like it or not, within these national political games. Uh, and, and, uh, and there are all kinds of conflict entrepreneurs on the local levels. Uh, that uh, that make th these uh, difficult. And this last uh, last factor I would just mention is that unlike uh, the peaceful uh, separation of let's say uh, Czechia and Slovakia, or going back even further, Norway and Sweden, <laughs> um, we are now dealing with two countries which suffer from a number of internal problems. Um, uh, the, f the the war with between the uh, Mughal and uh, uh, the the Lu no. new air. Uh, I mean, these are these are dramatic developments, and of course, in a situation like that, there is always a risk that uh, that instability becomes becomes a part of the negotiations themselves. Unfortunately, uh, it stems from uh, from uncertainty, from weaknesses, from from. The fact that the longer the war or conflict lasts, the more complicated it becomes and, uh, and, and the more difficult it, it, it becomes to solve it. But my main line of thinking is that um, going back to the, the answer to my question, to the question no, is that the opportunities to stabilize these uh, difficult relations uh, must be linked to existing interdependencies between these two countries because there is no other way to think uh, and these interdependencies must be strengthened further. It is about oil resources. It deba it's about land use, migrations of large populations, we must remember. It's about cross-border trade. And it's about labor migration and citizenships. So um, we, we have to, ha we, I mean, uh, the, to the extent that the international community have any role to, pray, to play, I think it still we have to go for promoting integration in the in these in, uh, in these areas, 
to prevent imbalances, a uh, need for soft border, uh, combined with a detailed regulation, of course, of rights and duties of citizens, uh, citizens on, on both sides. Uh, but, but it's very, very difficult, uh, very, very important that um, you distinguish or you separate rights from border delineation. Rights to exploit resources should be something different from boundaries and borders. And that is, uh, is what we, you, you call soft borders and which, which uh, and any other alternative would lead to, uh, to a breakdown in, in, in these relations with potentially very, very dramatic result for, the, for a much larger region than, both, mm -hmm. than just these countries. Mm -hmm. So I will stop here. Thank you.